and all the new guys would get stuck with these lifers and you know the door gets shut and, and, and like hey good luck here's your pepper spray and your man down do you ever have to use pepper spray i i there was a time where i was supposed to use it but i didn't so you got they i remember in the academy they said you'll either freeze fight or flight nigga i froze uh, what like, happened? Uh, this is where I, this is how I lost my job. In this episode, we're joined by Damon Darling, who shares his incredible journey. He starts with his teenage years and first experiences with alcohol, leading to a challenging battle with addiction. Along the way, Damon takes on a job as a correctional officer, but his struggle in this role lasts no more than six months. This episode highlights Damon's inspiring turnaround, where he finds comedy as a driving force for his success. Join us as we explore Damon's highs and lows and how humor becomes his pathway to fulfillment and achievement. Everyone, I hope you all had a wonderful Christmas with your families. And as my platform continues to grow, one of my goals for 2024 is to get more involved in my community during the holiday season and give back however I can. Did you know that for the past couple of weeks, we've been in the top 50 for society and culture podcasts on both Apple and Spotify. And it looks like we'll be heading into 2024 with nearly 200,000 subscribers on YouTube. Such an incredible first year. All thanks to each and every one of you who tune into this show. Remember to leave us a review on Spotify and Apple Podcasts, share your favorite episode with a friend, and sit back, relax, and get ready to lock in with Damon Darling. Damon Darling, welcome to Locked In, man. Pleasure to have you. You came from uh, Ohio today, right? Yeah, Ohio. How was the yeah. flight in? Flight was cool. It was quick. It always is. <laughs> um, yeah. And I was sitting next to this big dude. He kept taking my elbow space. I finally <laughs> just leaned outside the aisle and let him have it. <laughs> you know, we, we had this guy, um, 1090 Jake, on the show last week, and some guy was, like, falling asleep on uh, on him during uh, while he was sitting uh, in, in the airplane seat, and he was telling me that story, too. Yeah, I was just <laughs> like, bro, you can have it, dog. So, so we uh, we got connected uh, through Kyle Overmeyer, who was uh, yeah. the, the sheriff on the show. Yeah. Um, and it was funny, when we were talking to get you on the show, you texted me randomly, like, a couple of days later, and you're like, yo, I was a CO, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, is that yeah. gonna be okay? And I'm right. like, yeah, we interview uh, prison guards too. But you, you had a short stint as a prison guard. Yeah, like right, right after that, I seen an episode where you interviewed a CO. Yeah, so I was like, oh, okay, that's so random. That, no, yeah, that, I know. That you were a prison CO, and we'll, I know we'll get my into life that. is random, bro. <laughs> like yeah, my entire so existence. Let's start at like the beginning of your of your story. Where are you from? Where did you grow up? What's like early childhood life like? I grew up in Urbana, Ohio. It's like a town of like, what, 10,000 people. And uh, there's like hardly any black people. Um, it was really, there's a little more now, but when I was in high school, we probably had like three, three or four. And um, so I just really never felt like I fit in. You know what I mean? I never really liked myself. I never liked looking in the mirror, um, shit like that. And, uh, <clears throat> so just insecure, but, um, I found out I was funny and that kind of made things a little better because I just make people laugh to be accepted and to be liked and things like that. Um, uh, my mom was a single parent. Uh, she raised five boys all by herself. Um, went to nursing school, uh, did all that while raising us. Um, she had two sets of twins, so I'm a twin. Uh, my younger brothers are twins. Um, what else? Uh, yeah, man, it was just tough. We didn't, you know, she would work a lot of overtime to make sure we could get like Old Navy and, you know, Aeropostle and Abercrombie, you know, shit that people in Ohio was wearing back in 2000. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? So, uh, you know, I always, um, you know, respected my mom for just going above and beyond making sure we'd had shit we didn't really need but felt like we needed to be liked and um uh you know sometimes we'd eat fucking popcorn for dinner bro you know she'd be like you know uh 
I just bought you guys all school shoes, so, you know, we're going to have to eat, like, ramen, popcorn, you know. And she'd, like, kind of warn us before, like, you guys want to, like, eat good or y'all want some new shoes for school? I was like, nigga, I want them new shoes. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. so it was tough, but, um, it was, it, you know, I still love my mom. It was, um, even though it was, like, rough financially and stuff, we still had a lot of fun and good memories and things like that. The kids pick on you? Uh, yeah, they would try, um, like kids would come up and like check the back of your tag and see, you know, if it was real name brand and if it wasn't, you'd get roasted for shit like that. Kids would do that? Oh yeah. Oh shit. Yeah, yeah, bro. (laughs) So, um, that's what I'm saying. That's why I was like, you know, beg, I would beg my mom, like, please get like, I got to get this brand (laughs) and and it's got to be real. And yeah. But other than that, nah, man, I was pretty cool. Um, like I said, I was I was the funny guy, so I, I pretty much was cool with everybody. Um, but um, yeah. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so how would um? I, I still can't believe kids would check the t- the tags. Oh, I know. Because I yeah. like I I've experienced being bullied and seen what kids could do, and I've never seen like the checking the tags thing. So that's got to be rough, especially if you knew your family was was struggling mm-hmm. too. Yeah. How did you know that, like, comedy and making people laugh kind of got you out from being, like, bullied in a way? It was kind of like your escape path. Um, Because I'd always get made fun of, like, not just for that, like, the clothes stuff, but, like, how I looked and, you know, just being scrawny and, you know, being black shit. Um, And... I noticed whenever I would be like just being myself, just being serious, having conversations with people, they would laugh like in the middle of my conversation a lot of the time. And I just started to realize that I was just funny. Like people just thought I was funny. So I would just start doing it on purpose. Like I started to hone it, you know, like and do it on purpose and be funny. So then I got good at, you know. Tearing down people, too. <laughs> you know, like, even though they tear me down, I, I got good at tearing people down. So once I started snapping back, you know, it, things just got a little better for me. You know, there's a, there's definitely a power in, in taking, like, bad moments and turning it into comedy. Because mm-hmm. that's essentially what I do with my story. Um, yeah. You know, like, taking those bad prison moments and turn it into a funny story. Yeah. So, you know, when you're the kid that's bullied and you kind of see... And you mm-hmm. ha- you know you have like this talent too. It's interesting that it kind of like evolves right there. Yeah, and that's what comedy really is: is pain, suffering, you know, uh, shortcomings. Like you take all that, that the hard times and the negative, and you make <clears throat> you make light of it. You know, did, you, what were your like aspirations at that time? Did you want? Did you know you wanted to be a comedian, or did you mm-hmm. want to go to college and do something with your life? What was the plan? Uh, not right away, but, um, like I grew up in a strict, uh, Christian household. So my mom made us go to Bible study. We had to go to Bible study like three times a week. Um, we weren't allowed to watch rated R movies. We weren't allowed to watch Disney movies if they had magic in it. Like, I mean, that's, I'm just letting you, trying to (laughs) show you like how strict it was. So I didn't know of a lot of entertainers right away, but as I got older and I would like, um, go to friends' house and stuff, um, I started to um, learn about comics like Dave Chappelle. And um, I remember when I first saw Dave Chappelle, uh, I for, I'm not really sure what movie or situation introduced me to him first. But the more I saw him, the more I saw, like, me. You know, just not like, not to say, like, I'm funny like Dave Chappelle, but just, like, the skinny, black goofiness of him. Like, I saw that in me. Mm-hmm. And I was like, man, people love this dude. And so then I kind of realized then that I wanted to, you know, be an entertainer at least, you know, get into acting and, you know, stand up and stuff, shit like that. So. Do you end up going to college at all? I did. Uh, I went to college a ton of times and I dropped out <laughs> every single time, bro. Uh, I'm trying to think the first college I went to, I want to say it was Wright State university that's in Dayton and I really just went there because I needed a place to stay so I like filled out all the paperwork and got my grandma to co-sign and 
so I could crash on the in the dorms, but I never really did my homework or went to class. That was when you were 18? I was about, uh, I was like 19, 20. So what were you doing at that point in your life? That what you was needed, I doing? Yeah, that you needed a place to sleep. Oh, uh, I, was, I was drinking all the time, partying. I was alcoholic, man. By the uh, time you're 19? Yeah, full blown, bro. How, Just, did, how did that start? Uh, I started, I had my first drink, I think I was like 16. Um, Ohio's a big party, like, it, as soon as the weekend comes, everybody's drinking, bro. Like, you know, bonfires, kegers, you know, things like that. And, you know, then football and all that. Any reason really to drink, they're drinking. Um, but, yeah, I had my first beer at, like, a little party when I was 16 that I, you know, um, lied to my mom about to be able to go to. But uh, I remember after a couple beers, um, it just, I felt really good, man. Like, uh, I got a lot more confidence, uh, you know, um, just felt good, felt happy. Uh, it tasted good. I know a lot of people say beer is like an acquired taste and they didn't like it right away. I liked it right away. I loved the taste of it. And um, so basically, uh, whenever there was an opportunity or a party that I could get to um, on the weekends, I would try to get to it so I could drink after that. That was pretty much it. And then once I got, you know, older, it just got worse and worse the older I got. It turned into like a weekend thing to um, whenever I wasn't at work, you know what I mean? And then it turned in from whenever I wasn't at work to calling out of work so I could do it. You know, if there was a party scheduled during my shift or, you know, something like that that I wanted to be at, I'd just, I mean, I would quit jobs so I could drink, you mm -hmm. know, and just party. I just never wanted the party to stop. That was my problem. Do you think you were using that as like an escape from not having maybe the best childhood growing up and having everything? I think it definitely was. Um, and I think also a part of it was being held back from so much because of the religion, religious stuff. Uh, I felt like I missed out on a lot because um, there was only a handful of times in high school that I really could, you know, drink and stuff. Cause my mom had such a strict watch on us, but, um, when I could get away, I would, um, but yeah, absolutely, man. That definitely p played a part in it. I was trying to fill some kind of void, um, whether it was just what I missed out on childhood or, uh, the insecurities I had with myself. Um, oh man. And I just really liked the party. I just, I mean, I really just liked partying and I didn't want to stop partying. You think if you had the stability growing up and had access to like, I would say maybe a little bit more of a normal childhood and not uh, with the religious barriers uh, and restraints that the alcohol wouldn't have felt the same when you did try it? Uh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I, I feel like if my dad was present and he gave me the confidence I needed as a man, that would have played a huge part. Uh, I feel like if I had more reasonable... Um, expectations from my religion religion that that would have played a huge part um of you know a bunch of things but um i think there was unreasonable expectations from the religion uh it was almost like perfection was needed and that put a lot of strain on me and you know i had a lot of fear from god you know i, I still battle with it on a daily basis today um you know, I just daily got to convince myself, like, God loves me. I'm doing enough, I'm, you know, by trying. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, man. When do you think the drinking brought you to, like, rock bottom? <clears throat> um, I was living in San Diego because I had moved to San Diego. Um, uh, I don't know, maybe around 20, 21. Uh, my mom had moved out there with my younger brothers. Uh, she had signed on with a travel a agency, a nursing travel agency. And they pretty much housed her and everything. And uh, so I moved out there with her. 
And I stayed out there for about 10 years. But the whole time I was out there, I was pretty much just fucking off, bro. Like, I was just the same shit I was doing in Ohio. Drinking, chasing girls, partying, working shit jobs. Uh, just making sure I made enough to support my habit. And um, I ended up having kids outside of marriage with a, with a woman that I didn't barely even know, didn't love, tried to force it, didn't work, um, got divorced. Um, I was still trying to uh, do the religion thing off and on. And um, I got hit with child support. I remember that made me really stressful because once the child support hit me, I couldn't afford anything, bro. In California, like California alone and then child support, like, bro, I, my check would be like 20 bucks. <laughs> like I didn't have nothing. So um, anyways, uh, long story short, I, I pretty much just ended up living out of my car. Um, I was behind on my child support. The repo man was looking for my car. So I was always like moving it around. I was stealing alcohol from grocery stores, bro. Like I actually got into an altercation with a little kid, like a young kid, bro, like trying to steal alcohol. And like the beers went all over the parking lot and like he called the cops and I had to get out of there. That was one of the moments for sure where I was kind of like, bro, what the fuck are you doing? Like, you are lame as fuck. Like, you're stealing beers, dog. Like, But that still didn't get you to change. No, it didn't. I was still doing it. And then um, I, got a co- I got a DUI. Um, still didn't change. Um, I'm not sure what one thing it was. But um, one day, you know, I just called... Uh, my buddy in Ohio and I just, you know, was telling him everything that was going on, my best friend. And he encouraged me to just move back to Ohio. And he was like, yo, you could just stay with me uh, until you get on your feet. And, um, you know, we get you back going again. So um, I think in that moment, I, I knew I needed to just like make a decision. And it was hard. I decided to go, but it was hard because I had to leave my kids. They were in San Diego. So um, it wasn't easy, but um, I did. I left, and um, I remember I got back to Ohio. I kept drinking for a couple months, and then um, I don't know, man. I don't know what one thing, like I said, I don't know what one thing it was because I had, there were times where I ended up in the hospital um, for alcohol poisoning, all kinds of shit, and um I think I just remember coming home to his house drunk as hell one night and I was just having a conversation with God and I was just tired, man. I think I was just tired of losing, tired of being lame, tired of not, you know, being able to see my kids, not being able to provide for them, not being able to provide for myself. Just, I mean, I pretty much was at rock bottom, bro. I was just bumming, you know, people taking care of a grown ass man, like, And then I had dreams, things that I wanted to do. I was just afraid to to try to do them, too. So I was kind of suppressing that. And I just had enough. And I was terrified to quit drinking, man. And I told God, I was like, man, uh, you know, I want to quit. I don't want to do this anymore. But I'm 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 afraid if I stop drinking, I'm going to die. So I just got down on my hands and knees. And um, I told him I was like, hey, you know, if you give me another chance at life, Like, I promise I'll do it the right way. Like, I promise, please just give me another chance. And then I even told him, um, but if I quit and I die and if I have to die, then whatever, I have to die. But I don't want to go on like this. Like, if I have to, if I can, if I have to die sober, I'd rather do that. You know what I mean? Then continue to live like this. That's how tired and ashamed and disgusted with myself I was. And um he uh he answered me because the next day I I quit cold turkey. And um uh, it was hard as fuck, man, like you know, sweating and 
uh, you know, heart racing and, <clears throat> you know, it sounds like I was probably having more symptoms that I don't fucking know what they're called because I'm not a doctor, but I felt like death, bro. I didn't, there were times that I felt like I probably wasn't going to make it. Um, but I just really wanted to be a good father. I wanted to provide for my family. I think that that was one of the main things, you know, you kept asking me like about the childhood and struggling. Um, I think that was one of the main motivators is I just wanted to be able to provide for myself. I never wanted to be rich. I never wanted to have a bunch of money. I think one of the, the most frequent prayers that I would pray to God was just allow me to be able to provide for myself. That's all I want to do. Like, I mean, I couldn't even get jobs at like shitty places, bro, sometimes like Subway, you know, like I would get rejected for jobs like that. Like imagine what that would do to your self-esteem. Why do you think you, you know were rejected I mean? for that? I don't know, man. Like I, there were just, I couldn't get the shittiest jobs, man. And then even when, when I would get them, I'd be so excited and happy. And then I would just realize they were shit <laughs> every time. And I'm like, why am I happy about this? I still can't provide for myself. This still isn't enough. Um, I don't know, man. But I got tired of living like that. Like, and, um, I don't know, man. But now, you know, things are different. Um, when you were drinking for like those 10 years in San Diego, out of that time, how much would you say you were intoxicated? 90 at least 90 percent of the time so was it describe like the routine are you waking up and immediately having a drink how, how does that uh, work is no. it like water or are you just no my alcoholism was a little different i wasn't like one that there were times definitely where i'd get up and like day drink but r rarely i was more of like a night drinker so if i drink all night i would usually sleep all day and then get up, shower, get dressed, hit up my other drunk friends and be like, what's going on? And Or try to get in contact with some girl that I ran into or some female. I'd be texting like seven girls at a time, you know, uh, trying to feel love. And uh, that's, you know, that's pretty much what, what my day would be. I would get drunk all night, sleep all day. If I had a job, I'd go in hung, hung over, feel like shit. Um, I remember I was a uh, <clears throat> I was a supervisor at Walmart in San Diego, and I basically just did change runs. And so, I remember I was so stoked when I got that position too. It was like a dollar more, and uh, I got in. I had just clocked in. I was hung over as shit, and I went over to the count the change drawer and I was trying to unlock the change drawer and I couldn't get it unlocked and I was like what the fuck and finally my co-worker said Damon that's your car key and I was like oh shit <laughs> so yeah that's how hungover I was when you're drinking that much do you even like know what it's like to be sober at, at that point mm -mm. during that time that's period? what I'm saying bro <laughs> like when I no, I was afraid to be sober. I couldn't function sober. Like, I remember when I first got sober, it was really hard for me to be around people. And I was never a shy person. I, you know what I mean? Like, but it was so hard for me to be around people, so hard for me to just do what we're doing right now, have a conversation. Like, my anxiety would be through the roof. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, it takes a lot to sit down, at, especially with a stranger, and, and talk about childhood trauma and past yeah. addictions and struggling but and overcoming that it's hard yeah so why people don't see therapists yeah i do <laughs> i go every week that's good yeah and it helps tremendously i got a good ass therapist <laughs> bro he just be like he, he tells it to you real oh man he does but then he gives me he gives me ways to deal with things to fight back you know so it's not like i'm just unloading my shit and he's like oh yeah well, that's uh, you know or do he gives me coping mecha mechanisms and so i'm able to get better mm -hmm. you know i don't have to just 
submit to this and just stay at this level of shit that I'm in. Now, you know? now did your um, addiction to alcohol, did that only lead to DUI, at, uh, getting a DUI as like criminal charges? Uh, DUI, theft. Um, I think that's it. Did it. Those are felonies? No. Oh, they were a DUI is a misdemeanor? Uh yeah, it was a misdemeanor. Really? Yeah. Isn't it I thought it's a felony, no? Oh. Uh, as far as I know, I'm not a felon. So I might be. So you got the DUI before <laughs> becoming a prison guard? Yes. So how did yeah, it's so not you, a felony. Yeah, it's, right. It wasn't. So how did you become a prison guard then? How do you go from alcoholic to prison CO? Um, were you drinking while you were a CO? No, I was sober by then. Uh, I had I was back in Ohio by then already, and I already had a few years of sobriety under my belt. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> it's weird that I even did that because I, you know, like I'm I'm a big rap fan and stuff, so it's like I'm, I wasn't like someone who want ever wanted to be a cop or anything close to it, you know. Not that I have anything against cops or anything. I have family members that are police officers. Yeah. So. But it's just nothing I ever wanted to do. <clears throat> but that's how bad I wanted to provide for my family, man. That's all I ever wanted to do. So I was like, you know, they were hiring people left and right, and it paid really good at the time. So I was like, fuck it. I'm going to do this, man. I'm going to be a CEO. And I remember being so excited about it too, bro. I would like, I was like bragging about it on Facebook. Like I just really thought that it was going to be the best thing to ever happen for me. And it was just going to, you know, give me the life I wanted. And I got in there and it was just a nightmare, bro. <laughs> a nightmare. Like, I don't even know why I was thinking that. Like, it was almost like I didn't even know what the job was that I was going to do. I was just, someone just told me what it paid and I was like, oh yeah. You know that I had tunnel vision on like the pay. How much did it pay? Uh, I think at the time it started out a little over 18. $18 an hour. Yeah. But this was what bro? This was like four or five years ago. So did they send you like training? Did you go to like a boot yeah, camp? Yeah, I had to go to uh, training, what's, the academy. <laughs> what's prison CO training like? Well, it's really fucking corny, bro. Like, <laughs> it's like renting the cops. <laughs> Is it really? Is it like a you mall ever seen, uh You ever seen national security? Uh, I've never seen Oh, okay, either. never mind. <laughs> uh, it was kind of like that. So but, is it is it tough or is it? No, nah, I did it. Man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, tough. but I mean, no, nah, I, I mean, and they basically just you do like slideshow, like they they show you videos and like you know like normal orientation, but it's like prison shit, and they tell you prison stories and they show you some bloody shit of s stuff that's happened in you know, prisons, they talk about the Lucasville riots and things like that. And, you know, they weed out the, 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 the scaredy cats, you know what I mean? So some people would walk out. I was kind of scared, bro. I'm not going to lie. Like I should have just walked out, but I was trying to be tough. I had already told my girl, man, like we're going to do this. Like I'm going to pay all the bills. Like I just wanted to be a man so bad that I was willing to do anything. But, um, I kind of knew, I kind of knew like before the academy was up that I, I had fucked up, you know what I mean? But I was like, when did you realize it was like your first fuck up? Uh, like when they were showing me those, <laughs> those videos of like people being murdered and like COs being attacked. I was like, I, I fucked up. Like, <laughs> <laughs> they weren't the nah, I was like, I can't fight. You know what I mean? Like, I, I don't like confrontation. What am I doing, bro? Like I'm tripping. Why did, what did I get myself into now? And, uh, but I knew I, I had to stick it out, man. Where did they stick you? They stuck me at Madison, uh, prison in London, Ohio. And is that a tough prison? Uh, it's, it's one of the tougher ones because uh, they have level three prisoners in there. <clears throat> and I think they had just started getting them. They were like fours that were getting a chance to be threes. And, um, you know, a lot of them were lifers. And when you're the new CEO, or when you're the CEO, when you're the new CEO, you get the, sh the shitty units, like, because they bid on them when you go in 
for your shift. And this, those that have seniority always get the easy ones. They get like the level ones where they they can free roam and like, you know, go to the barber shop. They can go to the gym. You know, they got open bays and pool tables and shit. You know, where not, these people are going home. They're not trying to cause no trouble. So and then all the new guys would get stuck with these lifers and you know, the door gets shut and, and, and like, hey, good luck. Here's your pepper spray and your man down. Do you ever have to use pepper spray? I, I, there was a time where I was supposed to use it, but I didn't. So you got, they, I remember in the academy, they said, you'll either freeze, fight, or flight. Nigga, I froze. Uh, what like, happened? You uh, tell this us is where, this is how I lost my job. <laughs> I, oh, I they lasted, fired you? Oh, yeah. I lasted like six months. <laughs> I last, and I was I, I was on high blood pressure medicine trying to keep this job. The okay. doctor had to put T- me tell on. Tell us the story. Yeah, yeah. Okay, <laughs> I'm all over the place. So I got I go in one day, and um, a fight just broke out. Man, this white dude, this little white dude, and this big ass black dude, they just start hitting, and I just watched it. <laughs> My, you know. Uh, I'm trying to think where my partner was. I think he was doing a round up top or something. This I was down low. And uh, they're just hitting. I didn't pull my man down. I was supposed to do that. Didn't do that. Man down. So a man down is like this little device that you pull it if something's wrong and you need help. And they send more COs to come help you. And you got to let them in. So I didn't pull that. I should have pulled my pepper spray out to stop the fight. Didn't do that. And then uh, I finally came to as they're hitting and I walk over to the desk because I heard the phone ringing. And I'm like, <laughs> bro, I'm just, I'm, I don't know what happened. I blacked out. So my buddy, by this time, my buddy sees what's going on. He's running over. He done pulled his man down. He ain't there yet, though. And the other CEOs beat him they're knocking on the door before he even gets to the fight. This is a big unit. You know, he's upstairs. And uh, they're banging on the door, and I'm just looking at them bang on the door. I don't even go let them in. That's how that's how scary I am, bro. Like, and they're just like, what are you doing? What are you doing? And finally I come to, and I go, but, like, let them in. And they're like, what the fuck were you doing? Why were you standing there? And I was like, oh, I, I the phone was ringing. I went to get the phone. They was like, you don't need to worry about the phone. When it, I was just trying to make up any excuse, you know, that I could. And, um, yeah, man, that was, that was pretty much the end of my CEO. <laughs> so what, career. they fired you for they that? They called me up like like an hour later. They called me up to the captain's office or lieutenant or whoever the fuck I went and saw. And there was like three of them in there. And they were like, so what happened? And I was like... <laughs> I was like, I don't know. I was like, they was like, what? You didn't pull your man down. You didn't spray him. Like, what happened? I was like, I I don't know. I was like, I guess I just didn't want to get in the middle of that. And they're just like, well, you got to do something. You can't do nothing. And I was like, hey, man, I don't know, bro. Like, I don't know. Like, are we done or <laughs> or what? And it's like, man, you th- you think this is the job for you? And I was like, no, probably not. And it was like, yeah, this is so random. I know, <laughs> like literally random as fuck. <laughs> They're just letting me down soft, You're like easy. Like, dude, you're not meant to be a prison guard. Yeah, they, yeah. So they pretty much let me go. And I, to tell you the truth, bro, I was so happy inside. I was like jumping for joy, like yeah. Did you have to do like strip searches and everything like that? Mm-hmm. What was that like as a as a man having to do that to another man? I didn't like it personally. Uh, nothing about the job was me, bro. Like, um, I don't really have any strip search stories, but um, I remember walking by doing because we had to do our rounds like every fifteen minutes, and I remember walking and I looked in and this big black dude was butt ass naked, bro, just beating this shit and I was just like what the fuck and so I banged on his door and I was like yo man like what the hell I was like stop doing that or I'm gonna spray you and he was like oh come on man and I was just like bro 
And like that image is burned in my head, bro. It's just, it's there for life. Oh, man. <laughs> I always used to remember, you know, being an inmate and seeing the the brand new fresh on the off the street prison guards and stuff mm-hmm. walking around. They're all like pristine and stuff, just yeah. trying to figure things out. Those are the guys that could be assholes, though. Do you mm-hmm. think like you were a nice guard or, or, or a mean guard? No, nah, that's where I fucked up, though, because they told me specifically when you go in there, you need to start out mean as fuck, hard as fuck. And then you can kind of like tone it down as you go along. But you can't go in there and start out super nice like you can't and then try to be hard later and try to get them to listen later because it won't work. And I was like, man, they don't know what they're talking about. I'm a people person. People like me. All I got to do is make them laugh and they're going to love me. Like, I'm going to be the cool guy, you know, bro. So I went in there doing that. And they did like me. They did think I was funny. You took advantage? Oh, yeah. But when I needed them to lock down, they'd be like, nah, man, well, you ain't finna do shit, bro. You, you the funny guy, Yeah, man. those are the best guards, <laughs> man. <laughs> yeah, you the silly little dude. Did man. anyone, like, try to try you, like, to, to like, uh, get you to do a bribe or anything like that? Oh, yeah. Um, <clears throat> it was crazy because I actually, uh, there was a dude that I went to high school with in my unit. And I never said anything. I don't know if he ever said anything, but I never said anything. But as soon as I saw him, I was like, oh, shit, because, you know, you're supposed to say something Mm -hmm. if that happens. And uh, it was funny because as soon as I went in there and he was like, you know, like we neither one of us said anything. But he you know how you just know, like as soon as I locked eyes with him and, and I was like, oh, hey. And he was like, oh, hey. It was like we both knew like we damn it. And I was yeah. like, yo, like we both knew. And he was like, hey, man, if you're ever trying to make some extra money, let me know. <laughs> and I was like, what? Were you tempted? He didn't even talk like that. <laughs> yeah. What he said. He to- Were you tempted at all? I might have thought about it for a split second, but I'm just way too scary, bro, to do <laughs> anything remotely like criminal that that will get me some time like that, you know? Can but, um, prison guards, like, eat the food that the inmates were eating, too? How how, was, how would that work? Do you guys get uh, your Not as trays? far as I know of. So you got to bring your own lunch and yeah, stuff? Yeah, I always had to bring my own lunch. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yeah, he was like, you ever trying to make some money, extra money, let me know. And I was like, what? <laughs> but then it wasn't just him. Other other guys, man, they would come up to me and say, hey, man, uh, you try you you try to make some money like what's up come on I know you and then it got more and more aggressive every day man uh th- then guys started saying hey if if you don't play we'll get rid of you we'll get until we get somebody in here that will mm-hmm. do what we need them to do and i was like for real i thought y'all liked me i told y'all that joke remember y'all laughed but nah, man. And then they were telling me personal things about myself mm-hmm. like the color of my car like where I lived and I was like what bro like legit that feeling you get in your stomach like that tells you you should probably get the hell out of here <laughs> yeah, you're like get me the fuck out of here yeah bro I was like how the hell do they know this about me you know so it was like shit like that started happening did you see anyone that was like battling addiction or was in there because of addiction and then came off the streets I mean, yeah, there was definitely uh, drug addicts in there and stuff, people that were still doing drugs in there. Did it make you feel like, you know, have some thought because you were a recovering addict? Well, yeah, because I went in there with the mentality, I this I can help people, you know? Um, that's how I went in there. But I learned really quickly most guards go in there with the mentality of I can control people and I can have a power trip and I can just be the god in here. Like— Nobody went in there really thinking like me. Like I was thinking maybe I can mentor some people. Maybe I can help people, some people get on the right right track, you know? And like nobody was thinking like me. You've had quite like the 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 life. I mean, you go from alcoholic at a teenager to prison guard, the most mm. random thing ever, and then you <laughs> yeah. and, and then you start a, a comedy career. Yeah, yeah, man. My life, I'm telling you, my life has been just I've I've done about every retail job you can think of. I've I've just been through it. Uh, How did like the comedy career start? So uh, the comedy started. I think I took a few more jobs after that, and then I finally um, told my wife I was like, um, 
hey, I really want to try this comedy, you know? And um, she supported me. She was like, okay, like you can try it. And um, she told me, I remember we were walking. Uh, we're at like this outdoor mall place. And uh, it's called the Green Town Center in Dayton. And it has a funny bone comedy club in it. And so I had did like a couple open mics. and um, But I still really didn't know like how to break into this industry. So I was walking, we were walking through that uh, mall one day and we walked by the Funny Bone and she was like, hey, why don't you get a job there? And I was like, you got to understand like someone who is a big fan of comedy and stand up and like shit like that. You see this A room club. I'm thinking like, bro, they don't just hire anybody, you know, that's what I'm thinking because I'm looking at it like a, like it's a church or something. And she was like, why Why wouldn't they hire you? She, I was like, I don't know. I mean, you probably got to have, like, qualifications. Anyways, long story short, they hired me, and I got on as a door guy. And I couldn't believe it because, you know, that's how most comics start. They go to a club, they get on as a door guy, and, you know, the rest is history. So a door guy pretty much just seats, um, um, seats the guests, and they're kind of like security. You get rid of, like— hecklers and shit like that and then you also like check in on the comics at the green room like they need anything mm -hmm. shit like that so that was my end bro i was like watching comics comic after comic after comic live and just critiquing and learning and networking with comics um that would come to the club building relationships and um getting guest spots from comics and um working on my craft and finding my voice and that, that's pretty much the rest is history now it's really hard to stand out in comedy extreme and you, I, when you're doing like those small shows those don't really pay much right like mm. what can you expect to make on a night while you're starting out um <clears throat> if you have a pretty full room it doesn't even have to be sold out but if you have a pretty full room um you can make a you can make a couple grand you can make a couple grand mm -hmm. as a brand new comic Oh, if you're headlining. If you're headlining, yeah. But what are about, you talking about? Headlining or what? No, trying what stage? to trying to get like get your like your a grant. host, y either a host or trying to get your footing in it. Like you see okay. all these people are doing the stand up nights. Okay, so first off, when uh, so open micing and guest spots are the beginning, and you're not getting paid for either one of those. So you're just doing that solely to get yeah. your name out. there. Yeah, I remember my first guest spot was uh, with a comedian by the name of Country Wayne, and. Um, he just dropped a Netflix special. <clears throat> and uh, I had about five minutes of material. And he he said, can you work clean? And I, I lied and said yes. But my whole five minutes was filthy. What does that mean, clean? <clears throat> it was dirty. It was cussing and sex and, you know, just dirty jokes. And uh, so that night I went home and I tried my best to try <laughs> to make clean of what I had and it was just like near impossible. So I like tried to come up with some other stuff too and um, just didn't really succeed. Um, so I went up on stage and uh, that was my first bomb. Uh, yeah, man, I got maybe two chuckles the whole five minutes. Did that trigger any like w wants to go back to drinking and stuff? Cause you felt like, Oh yeah, yeah. absolutely, bro. I just kind of wanted to run, <laughs> you know, cause I knew I was funny, but then that, I don't know. It was kind of like, well, maybe you're not, um, but you know, looking back on it, obviously I just wasn't prepared. I wasn't ready. You know, comedy is the slow grind. It, it takes a while, you know, whether you're hilarious or not, it's, it's a hard craft. And, um, <clears throat> yeah, that that was a tough one. But, but, you know, something you were able to do that most comics that are starting out can't do is build a social media following. I mean, mm -hmm. you have, what, almost 800,000 followers on TikTok? Yeah, yeah. How, how did you pull that off? Uh, well, I started out um, doing skits, and <laughs> nobody really knew who I was. So, you know, people were just scrolling by my skits, didn't really give a damn. And I was like, man, this is taking too long. Like, I'm getting older, you know. I don't have a lot of time. I already wasted a lot of time drinking. I got kids to take care of. Like, <laughs> if I'm going to do this thing, I need to do it. 
you know, plus my wife, um, she was carrying most of the financial load so that I could do this. And um, that made me feel terrible, you know, as a man that you don't want that. Mm -hmm. And um, so I was like, what can I do to speed this up? So I was like, I noticed pranks got a lot more views than anything else on the Internet. Like pranks and like negative shit, <laughs> you know, like fights or whatnot. So I was like, I'm going to start doing pranks. So I started doing pranks, man, you know, going out and pranking people and stuff. And I was getting way more views. And then I stumbled upon uh, these drive through pranks. I was like, oh, I'll try these drive through pranks out. And I started doing those. And those were like the most views I had ever gotten. And I just stuck with that. And that's pretty much how my following blew up. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so, And you're making money from TikTok and social media. Mm -hmm. So that's your full-time gig now? Well, my full-time gig is content creating slash stand-up. Mm -hmm. I, I do make uh, decent money from stand-up, and I make decent money from content creating. So I get paid from Facebook and TikTok right now. Isn't it crazy that the thing that you used as a coping mechanism to get away from, like, the bullies and whatnot in high school became mm -hmm. the thing that, you know, would create a life for you in a way? Yeah, yeah. it is insane. Uh, I still really can't believe it. Um, it's crazy, man, because when I was doing guest spots, I never thought I'd get a hosting gig. Then when I got a hosting gig, I never thought I'd get a feature gig. And then when I got a feature gig, I never thought I'd be headlining. And now I'm headlining. And it's, it's, I can't believe it sometimes, bro. Because I've never been good at anything ever in my life, bro. You know what I mean? Always failed. I always get emotional right here. Mm -hmm. My bad dog. It just feels good to be good at something finally and be able to stick to something and not have to quit or start over. What keeps you going? What keeps you uh, motivated and on track and kept you through those times where you felt like giving up? My kids, man. My kids, my wife, and me, man. Like, I can't go back to drinking. I can't. If I go back to drinking, bro, it's over. You know what I mean? Are you able to, like, be in the same room as alcohol? Can you be around people that are drinking? Yeah, I'm past that. Like, like obviously, the clubs, there's a lot of drinking going on. I usually don't hang out, though. Like, I usually do my show, and I go. I go back to the hotel, or I go, if it's local, I go home. Mm -hmm. So I just don't hang out. And it sucks because sometimes I do want to shoot the shit with everybody. And, you know, I get invited to go do things. Like, um, I had some fans ask after a show ask me to go play board games with them. <laughs> uh, a, little, a little weird where they're going to chop you that, up. <laughs> that, that was very weird. And I was just like, I weaseled my way out of that. Um, but it's like, I just stay out of trouble, man. Like, I'm happily married. I love my kids. And I just, I do my show and I go home. Mm -hmm. uh, that's that's what I do. So staying out the way. Yeah, I mean, but I can't sit here and tell you that if I did hang out all the time and I did, you know, stay up all night with these guys, with the comics and the fans and stuff. I don't know if I I might have a drink. You know, who knows where that might take me? Do you think you'll ever have another drink again, or is that it forever? I don't think so. I don't have a desire to. I don't want to never. I mean, never say never, but. It's one day at a time, obviously, but I think as long as I continue to not put myself in situations where I can fail, I'll be fine. Because I think that's the only reason I've had success in this. I don't put myself in situations where shit can go wrong. Like, I don't hang out all night. I don't go out drinking with people that are out drinking. I don't go hang out with a group of girls, you know, like... So if I don't put myself in that situation, then nothing really can, I mean, what can really go wrong at home with my wife and kids, you know? Yeah. What, um, what are like the most important things to you right now in your life? <clears throat> my family, man, my wife, my kids. 
That's it. And what's in my in my hustle? That's <laughs> it. You gotta have the hustle. Got to. What's like? What's next for you? What's the next five years look like in your plan? Well, the way things are going, man, uh, things have been moving really fast this year. So, I think if it keeps going as, the way it's going, man, I see myself being a pretty famous comic. I think I'm gonna be torn. At least torn. Um, I mean, I'm torn, but on a small scale. I see myself touring all the big clubs, you know, all the improvs, all the funny bones, you know, all the big uh, franchises and just, you know, having shows every weekend. How many uh, people are is your normal crowd? Mm, this last crowd I had, it was about 80. 80. Mm-hmm. Which was good. That's probably... Uh, yeah, that was that was really good. You ever got nervous uh, going up there? Mm -mm. It's just natural. You go up there and you I, rock it. I get, I get um excited. I get excited. I don't call it nervous because in the beginning it was nervous because I'd be like, oh my god, <laughs> like oh no, <laughs> like. But now it's just like, oh, like, I can't wait to get up here. I need to hurry up and get up here. I want this. Like it's excitement. <clears throat> but it's also it's it's my new addiction too. So so you were able to convert like that energy that you had into alcohol into comedy yeah. in, a, in a way. Yeah, which is you know bittersweet. It's it's got its pros and cons. Have you had a conversation with your kids about what you've gone through and how to make sure that they don't go down that path? I've had a conversation with my oldest. I got one teenager. He's fourteen. All the other ones are like eleven and under. <clears throat> but I had a conversation with him about addiction because I see a lot of my habits in him. Like if he finds something he likes a lot, he kind of like goes overboard. Like it's all he does. It's all he wants to do. It's tunnel vision. Like uh, addiction isn't just drugs and alcohol. It's anything, bro. Like you can become addicted to anything. So his thing is like weightlifting right now. And I had to sit him down and just give him that whole sh spiel on addiction and teach him balance. You know, you got to have balance in everything. And as long as you have balance, you'll be all right. <clears throat> but you can't, you can't be like, you know, you just, hey, a little bit of do my, do my workout and then move on with my day, bro. <laughs> you don't have to work out the entire day because that's what he was doing. And I was like, that's me, you know, and I got, I find myself doing it. I'm sure you might even struggle with it with, with your podcast, but I find myself doing it with my social media, my skits, my pranks. Like sometimes I'll spend the whole day, bro, like editing videos or, you know, watching a post, seeing how it's doing or <clears throat> trying to think of my next, you know, prank or skit. And it's just like, bro detach for a minute <laughs> like you know what I mean like you could die tomorrow and you spent your whole day doing this and you didn't talk to your daughter you didn't talk to your son you didn't like watch a movie with your wife like detach for a minute bro no you know it's hard to do though because it's like the closer I get I feel like I need to work harder not less you know? Yeah, no, I'm the same way. I mean, I'm lucky, like, I don't have, like, like a wife and kids that are depending on me right now where I can really, you know, dive yeah, yeah. in. Like, I'm really committing, like, these, these two years right now between, you know, 28 and 30 to yeah. grind, you know, and, and make this shit happen. And it is different for you, absolutely. Mm -hmm. But you still, you know, you got friends, I'm sure, and you got family and, you know, shit, you, man. Yeah. Just make make some time for you. Got to find that balance. That's always been yeah. like, I'm when I'm all in on something, I'm all in. That's how I am. So, yeah. you know, it, it's just navigating and finding it out. But I am able to like, you know, if I'm going out with someone or doing something or whatever I'm doing, like I can, I plan, I'm a really good like uh, multitasker and organ, organizer. So right. if I know, all right, I'm going to go out Saturday night with someone, then I need to get all of this done. Um, right, discipline when, too. Yeah, but when you're in the building phase of a new business, it's tough too. You know, that's what you kind of yeah. Give but up. that's understandable. That's a little different. You know, you're you know you're getting things 
going. Like, that's what it was like the first two years I was getting into stand up. She kind of let me she work a part time job and so that I could just catapult, you know, get myself going. And then once I got going uh, that third year, I got a full time job. Mm -hmm. And so I was working full time and doing comedy. But now this summer, this summer, I was able to quit my job, bro. That's awesome. And I couldn't fucking believe it. I was so (laughs) happy. Yeah. Because I was in a factory, bro. And I was, I hated my life. I was going to do it for my kids and my family. But I was going to be miserable doing it, bro. Because I'd come home, I'd have no energy left. I'd have no niceness left. You know, everybody was just getting mean, Damon. (laughs) because <laughs> everybody at work got nice Damon yeah you know what I mean so it was just I was like I can't do this I was like God you gotta you gotta change my life please I'm putting in I'm doing the work you know a lot of people tell me they oh I got this or I got that like I even got comic buddies that make up excuses and I'm like nigga I got five kids and a wife and I had a full time job and I still did it you don't got no kids like, which is, don't come back when you got a real excuse, bro. Yeah, there, there's no they such just thing as excuses. Yeah, yeah. They don't want it. Yeah, that's what it. That's just what it boils down to. They don't want it bad enough. When, when you when you want something and you put in the work, you're gonna get to it. Yeah, you'll find a way. Exactly. And right. No matter what, no excuses. You just grind it out and do it. Mm-hmm. And that content creation is literally just all about consistency mm-hmm. and and showing up because you're gonna beat out the the ninety nine percent that can't do it consistently. Yeah, they quit after a year. Yeah. They don't see any results or they don't go viral. They're like, man, this ain't never gonna work, bro. It took me five years. I mean, look at Matt. Rife took yeah. him 10 years and that yeah. one video that I was listening to his interview, the one video that mm-hmm. he was going to not post on TikTok changed everything. Yeah. It's that. Yep. That's what my brother always would tell me. It's damn one video, one video. And he was right. Now I got countless viral videos. Bro. <laughs> and it's going to be the ones you least expect. That it it always is yeah. too, bro. Like when you don't believe in them, you're like, this is whack. Like it's the same with jokes too on stage. Like I hate when the crowd loves a joke. I hate. <laughs> I'm like, really? That's the one, bro? Like that joke is trash. What are what are your um like your biggest life lessons you would want the listener and the watcher to take away from your story? If you had to sit someone down. <sighs> That's tough, bro. The biggest life lesson. I don't know. Um Never give up, man. That sounds corny, but really, that's all. That's really what it boils down to, man. Yeah. I don't want to say some sober shit, but because everybody doesn't have a problem with, like, you know, I'm sure you could have a drink and you'd be fine, but I think it's never giving up, man, because there's so many times that I wanted to give up and that I did give up for a period of time. But you got to keep going cuz if you if you if you quit you're definitely not going it's not going to happen you know what i mean but if you if you keep going there's always going to be a chance there's always going to be hope you just can't give up you have to keep going bro like that's the only way to accomplish anything is to keep going consistency no matter what <laughs> no matter what bro that's it no matter what the outcome yeah you can't say oh i'm going to I'm going to do this as long as I get this. You got to say, I'm just going to do this. Like, that's what I told myself. I'm, I'm a comedian. No matter what, if I ever, if I never make it, I'm going to still be getting on stage telling jokes till the day I die. That's just who I am. And once you tell yourself that and you realize this is just, you're in it for life, everything else just falls in place. 